Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host of the podcast. Joining us in the podcast studios today is a good friend and colleague, Dr. Chris Rodemaker, uh, a man of uh, many levels of expertise and many titles. Chris, thank you very much for joining us here in the podcast studios today. Why don't you give a little bit of background on yourself, you know, what what you do for the pork industry today and what you brought you to this point in life. Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, being on with you today, Clayton. Yeah, so I'm a 1998 uh, graduate of uh, the University of Minnesota, born and raised in Minnesota. I had the opportunity to go back when I graduated and help my neighbor, who had started a little company called New Fashion Pork with Brad Frecking. So I got to spend the first 11 years uh, with that company as uh, the director of health services there in 2009, then I moved to Iowa to work for Murphy Brown, which uh, was a, the live production uh, animal part of Smithfield Foods. And I actually backfilled the position of a friend and colleague uh, who I work with today, Dr. Roger Main, when he left to take over as the director of operations for the uh, Iowa State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, I took his pr- uh, dire- uh, position as director of production improvement at uh, uh, Murphy Brown. So I got to work with uh, a group of 11 veterinarians uh, working on providing technical advice and doing some really cool research and and did that for five and a half years and then accepted the position here at Iowa State in uh, December of 2014 and have kind of been there ever since. So yes, kind of a uh, jack of all trades, master of none. So yeah. Well, I think uh, you're probably closer to a master of all trades than you give yourself credit for. <laughs> In all honesty, Chris, I've always respected your ability to um, uh, walk the the fine line of both collecting good data, but then also being a good communicator and being able to share and educate others with that data. And I think you know your background speaks of that from your your time at New Fashion to Smithfield to now in your extension role. Um, so. Because of that skill set, the industry typically doesn't give you easy problems. The industry typically says, hey, Chris, go work on the tough ones. And there's probably no tougher issue for the pig industry than PERS. Um, Chris, I know you've been working on a project with some of your colleagues at at Iowa State, um, trying to look at uh, what for some producers may be outside the box thinking on PERS management. Um, You want to talk a little bit about kind of uh, the background on um, uh, a unique vaccination strategy for some producers. For some producers, they may say, I've been doing this for a while, but I think it'd be safe to say that there that it's something you're looking at that at least more than half of the industry is not doing today. You want to talk to us a little bit about what the thought process is there and maybe um, how we measure success against PERS with any intervention strategy. Yeah, yep, that one is, uh, I know there was a, a thing, I went to an Asian conference and, you know, they were celebrating, you know, PERS, you know, 30 years of, of PERS and I was sitting there thinking, man, I'm not sure I'd be celebrating that. It's more like they've been, it's been kicking our rear end for over 30 years. So I'm not sure that was exactly something to celebrate, but yeah. So we've really watched that thing change over the years, right? And, you know, there's been a lot of things that we've been able to learn from that, you know, interventions that we put together uh, that have probably helped us with other diseases. You know, I think in particular PED, when PED came along, right, there were things that we were already doing from a per standpoint that really probably helped us uh, quickly able to stabilize and eradicate PED from cell farms. But yeah, you know, I can think back to the olden days, you know, early on, certainly in my practice career, that was just, you know, PERS was relatively new and herd closure was a new thing. And, you know, it was kind of like, some really neat work that people were doing, you know, getting PERS out of nurseries with mass vaccination and unidirectional flow. And that was working, you know, and just closing a breeding herd for four to six months without doing anything else. You know, we, we could get rid of those strains really easily. But certainly I think what we've seen more recently is our ability and, and as we've gotten smarter and put better control strategies in place, we've kind of watched Darwin's theory of evolution take place, you know, really uh, take kind of place right in front of us over the last 10 to 15 years. So as we've gotten better, we've selected for strains that persist for a lot longer a time, become more aerosolized in a way for, I always think back to Ian Malcolm's quote from the Jurassic Park movies, right? Life finds a way, right? Oh, we have all these female dinosaurs. How can they reproduce? Well, life finds a way. That's what we're kind of dealing with here with PERS, right? Is per- the PERS is finding a way to persist. And it's starting to evolve, you know, past our abilities to control it, right? So now, you know, we got to start thinking outside the box and looking at different tools, you know, 
evaluating different tools uh, than maybe what we have in the past. So uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Daniel Linharis and I, you know, Daniel did some really foundational work as a PhD student when he was at the University of Minnesota working with the late Dr. Bob Morrison, uh, looking at comparison, uh, comparing a couple of different load, close, and exposure strategies. One, at that time, you know, a lot of people were looking at live virus inoculation as perhaps a, a better means or methods of uh, you know, doing the uh, homogen homogenizing the immunity within the farm. And some people were doing vaccine and trying to wonder what was the better method of that to do that. So he had done some really foundational work, which, you know, said, well, with live virus inoculation, you know, we could create negative pigs a little bit faster, but that really came at a cost, right? There was, you know, uh, the time to baseline production, which was you know, defined as, you know, the time before the outbreak until we got back to the resumption of the normal amount of producing the normal amount of pigs out of the farm was a lot longer. And that was because we just lost more pigs kind of in that process. So <clears throat> we'd looked at that, you know, Daniel done some really foundational work at that, at that. And I think that probably moved, you know, the industry more towards using, you know, modified live vaccines as probably the primary stabilization methods in some of those, um, you know, herd closures and homogenization protocols. It, it's the financially responsible thing to do for a commercial pig farm, right? It, uh, yeah. The the volume of pigs outweighs the value of negative pigs a little bit faster. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And then that was really what he found, right? It was pretty stark. You know, I mean, it was, we don't want to have negative pigs, but, you know, if it's going to take a lot longer and cause a lot more, you know, mortality and stillborns and stillborns and mummies, you know, you just can't economically afford to be able to do that. So, so that was really some great work. And to kind of follow up on that, um, we started to look at different interventions, you know, uh, you know, as we've seen the viruses change, right? You know, what are some different interventions to be able to do that? And, you know, there've been killed vaccines that have been out there in the past, um, you know, traditional whole cell, you know, killed vaccines. And, you know, as, for the most part, haven't been traditionally very successful. Uh, we had uh, the group from Fibro approach uh, Daniel and I, and uh, just talking about uh, their product because theirs is a little bit different, right? You know, they've got uh, a different method of uh, typing uh, than what's traditionally done today. We kind of use these uh, have in the past used these restriction uh, nuke, you know, restrict. Or they always caught the RFLP, the restriction enzymes to cut the viruses up to try to give it some sort of name or nomenclature, but we know that's not very predictive to be, try to say, well, it's, is that a new strain or not, you know, and certainly didn't predict cross protection at all. So they've kind of developed a way of looking at utilizing some of the genetic sequencing that we've done on, on the, uh, the traditional or five uh, sequencing and looking at it a little bit different way, uh, looking at it at the amino acid and protein level, which ultimately, uh, may do a little bit better job of predicting uh, immunity or cross protection across it. And I'd had some during my practice days where it's like, well, you know, we would take these sequences and we'd have a virus and we'd, and we'd stabilize the herd. And then we'd start seeing clinical signs again and we'd send them the sequences. And even though they would be like 99.5% the same, they would come back and say, well, it's had a shift in this one key region, which changes an amino acid group. And now according to our groupings, you know, now it's going to look different, different to the immune system. And sure enough, we would start to see some of the, uh, we've seen clinical signs. So it's like, okay, well, the pig is telling us that it looks different, uh, apparently to them. So, so I had seen, you know, it certainly was intriguing enough. And then they've got uh, a vaccine. The vaccine process is a little bit different than traditional whole killed uh, PERS vaccines in the way that they uh, uh, extract out the nuclear protein. That's the most common part of that. That's the that's the, actually the part of the virus that gives us our ability to detect the virus um, uh, for our testing purposes. But we know that that antibody isn't protective at all. So they have a process of trying to uh, filter and, and uh, dilute that out so that they're only left with these protective envelope proteins that uh, would be much more conducive to producing a very protective immune response. So, so yeah, you know, so th and they've had some people, you know, some uh, some of my colleagues, you know, had used it and have had reported some successes. So we'd come together just to try to say, hey, you know, let's see if we can't get some, uh, generate some data, you know, to help. Because uh, a lot of, you know, what we'd heard were, you know, people's uh, accounts of, hey, I used it here and it looked good, but hadn't had a lot of good published data with that. So 
we uh, we worked through uh, taking some data that they had, some retrospective data from clients that they had using uh, the product. Uh, so I think we had like uh, 27 uh, different uh, herd outbreaks and 19 different herds. And then we compared that to Daniel's original uh, MLV database. Okay. So we did that and we went back and then did surveys with the herd veterinarians from the uh, the ones using uh, the MJ PERS vaccine. And we we're collecting additional data like what was the RFLP, which the herd size, what's the geographic region, you know, what's the guild development look like. And then we tried to take all that retrospective data because we kind of wanted to use that first, right? Is is there look like there may be something here that would, you know, uh, at least give us an indication that we would maybe want to do a more prospective study, you know, in the future. So, so we did that, looked through, um, combing through the data, collected the data from the individuals, and then put it into a, uh, a multivariable uh, model. We ran a univariate model at first. It looked like that their killed vaccine um, uh, could, uh, we saw an improvement in time to baseline production, but you know, there's a lot of confounders and all that survey data. So we wanted to make sure that we had a better uh, accounting for all those. So we put it into a mixed multivariate model to help isolate just the vaccine effect. And what we found there was um, that when we looked at total losses there, that using the killed vaccine over the herds that had the modified live, we saw uh, an improvement of about 697 wean pigs per thousand sows with the killed vaccines compared to the groups that had used modified live. So in, in the model, you know, had, uh, and that was very statistically significant, but I think the P value was like 0. 0.0021. So, um, so that, at least from a retrospective standpoint, it's like, okay, that, you know, retrospective observational studies are good for getting a look at to say, Hey, there might be something here that we would want to continue to investigate. And that would, that was really kind of the phase one, uh, of that is to say, yeah, but it looks like there may be something here, phase two, which we're hoping and still looking for, you know, um, herds that, you know, producers or veterinarians that might be interested in would be more like a retrospective where we would go in and enroll half the sows or gilts going into a farm and then monitor them through an outbreak. And then you would have, you know, your treatment and controls in the same farm here. We were, you know, comparing herds, uh, outbreaks from different, you know, completely different herds. So the you know, the external validity is that we're not comparing the same animals in the same populations, but it, at least it was enough to say, boy, it sure looked like there might be something here that warrants some further investigation. Passes the sniff test biologically, right? We're, we're using antigen that we know is similar to per strains that are circulating in our industry. It's evolving, right? But we That's are right. evolving too, right? We're updating our vaccine technologies to try and reflect the new challenges. Um, and it sounds like from your kind of phase one part of the project, it passes the sniff test and looking at the historical data, the herds that utilize that approach, use the killed vaccine on a recurring basis to keep in antibody levels high. They were able to return to normal pig production. So getting pigs out the door, right? Sow farms a break with purrs, get, get back to their normal lean pig volume faster than herds that weren't using that technology. Is that a fair way to summarize it? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent way to summarize it up. Exactly. You know, particularly for those herds that are maybe raising pigs in more endemic, endemically infected regions. That's exactly right. It's like, okay, I, I know my probability of, you know, getting this herd completely naive is probably low, but, you know, I, with these various methods and, and with this as being another option in there, I've got another ability to continue to keep the herd stable enough that I can uh, be, be pushing out negative pigs and raising pigs. That's, that's exactly what we're trying to do here with that product, I think. When it comes to raising healthy animals, you need more than the right solutions. You need the right partner who brings decades of industry expertise and a global team to put that knowledge to work for the advancement of your operation. At Fibro Animal Health Corporation, we are proud to work with you as your trusted partner. Chris, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, really appreciate what you do for the industry, whether it's, you know, PERS, uh, all your work you've done on antibiotics, and certainly the work you've done educating veterinarians throughout your, your life at, you know, Murphy Brown and, and now as an extension vet. Um, to the audience, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you can hear uh, more of Chris and I's banter as well as our, our, our uh, guests that we have on every week. 
Uh, Chris, thanks very much for coming on the show and sharing that information. Much appreciated. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. For uh, Dr. Chris Rodemaker, I am Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks and have a great rest of your day. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H E L L O at W I S E N E T I X dot com.